are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Five Key Insights Facility Managers Can Gain from Analytics. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented today by Pronto Forms. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items with you. Please note the control panel that is on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box in that panel. Please send your questions in at any time, and your speakers will address them at the end of the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure it is expanded so you can access the question box. Also, if at any time you are experiencing a technical difficulty, please send a message to us via that question section as well, and someone will reply to you uh, right away. So first, I'd like to introduce your speakers, Danny Lee and Corey Ayers. Danny is an analytics solutions architect for Pronto Forms. He is an information architect and data scientist with over 20 years of experience. He's worked with technology, software, utility, and government departments to design, develop, implement, and project manage business intelligence and data analytics programs. He spent over 16 years with Konyos IBM and has developed a rich set of expertise in business intelligence best practices, including development, data modeling, requirements gathering, project management, and technology implementations. He holds a partner certification in Burst and is a certified Konyos architect. He also has extensive experience with SAS and many other business intelligence platforms. So you'll hear from him today. Also, Corey is partner development manager for the Americas with ServiceMax from GE Digital. He joined ServiceMax in August 2015, and over the past two years, Corey has led enablement sessions for prospects, customers, and strategic partners alike. Corey is now a member of the ServiceMax Alliance's organization as a partner development manager. His responsibilities include enabling strategic technology partners and system integrators for the Americas. Corey is also a strong advocate for the digital transformation within field service for Fortune 500 companies that are currently using ServiceMax. So with that, I will hand it over to Danny Lay. Hi, Danny. Hi, Ann. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone, to our uh, presentation. I hope you guys get a lot of uh, insights into what we're going to talk about and, and some good takeaways uh, in terms of uh, what we talk about automation and what we talk from analytics. And my partner, Corey, from ServiceMax will give a little bit of, uh, of a demo on his technology and what he does as well, too. So today's agenda, what we're going to cover is the powerful mobile workflow that we use at Promo Forms today, uh, enabling our field users and, and various uh, other companies out there that can go from a paperless society, moving over to a more electronic format to collect information. Uh, along with that, we're going to talk about analytics and the art of the possible. So taking that data that comes from our field representations um, and having that go into a system where you can collect that and analyze the data for you know, current assets and, and future uses and so forth. Uh, along with that, we're gonna cover the five key insights that you can gain from the analytics and various ways and techniques that you can use to deploy analytics in your uh, organization. Uh, following that, we'll have, again, ServiceMax uh, talk about facility management. And after that, Corey will do a demonstration. And shortly following that, we'll do Q&A. So Prowl Forms, we are the leader in automating mobile workflows, and here are some of the few companies that we actually have uh, in, our, in our repertoire, if you will, that uses the full 360 view uh, with the organization uh, with our technology. So using Prowl Forms to submit data on the mobile devices and so forth, along with using Prowl Forms analytics to collect that data and analyze it for, few, um, for doing trending for doing you know operational reports and so forth so these guys have invested in us to make sure that the pulse of the business is running well uh, along with ensuring that their customers and anybody that they work with are getting the best quality out of their business so here is the three pillars that makes the efficient mobile uh, workflow uh, for a lot of our companies and a lot of our customers that we use and the first one on the left is efficient data collection. So not only are you moving from paper to mobile forms, but you're also uh, effectively collecting very clean data. So 
where you as you're interpreting a piece of paper and then having someone enter the data manually uh, onto a system or what have you, you're you're prone to errors because there's interpretation issues and there's all sorts of things that could go wrong during the collection of data. So having the ability uh, to collect data using commonality schemes or subject areas that have been predefined, you can erase all that kind of uh, mistaken uh, data entry points, uh, thus becoming better at uh, collecting that information and, re and refining and tweaking how data is collected in the field. Along with that, when the actual submissions are submitted, that data can then be shared with your partners, your customers, other field staff that do quality management, uh, any of that sort that uh, can be done in real time. So if there is a course correction needed the day of, let's say, repairing, a, repairing an engine or repairing an elevator, or perhaps uh, there is a, a missed opportunity at a customer site to do something, when one dispatches a form or submits a form that goes to another player uh, at the office, let's say, that does the review of that uh, real-time uh, data analysis, they can do corrective courses uh, to fix things in real time. So when that's all done, the next pillar, uh, which is the business insight, is the actual collection of data. Now, when collecting data, you're looking at things that happened the day before, right? So when we collect that information and you incrementally do day by day, week by week, month by month, that information is imperative to look at the overall health of the business. So from trending uh, last year versus this year's quality uh, assurance or tracking SLA agreements with your customers, ensuring that, you know, things that have been broken in the past are being repaired in the future, you can do the cross correlation from a year over year, quarter over quarter, or in some cases, our customers do month over month comparison uh, to make sure that the uh, that their uh, business is running tight and uh, tight and scheduled like. Now, from an analytics perspective, this is quite interesting because I did a little research and uh, as Anne kind of noted, I've been around the industry and in analytics for quite a while. So doing a little research, uh, I found that uh, analytics has actually been used for, uh, for a long time, even before computers were actually in play. Um, so back in the 19th century when uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor decided to do time management, he started initiating the whole tracking of, of people coming into the workshop and, and doing activities and so forth. And the next step up from that was uh, Henry Ford, uh, who measured the pacing of the assembly line. You know, and giving that revolutionizing of the manufacturing industry better uh, performance in delivering the product to their end customers. But uh, analytics began to command more attention in the late 1960s when computers actually came into play. So in the past, they used to call them uh, decision support systems. So where information came in, looking at the numbers, they would actually just decide what to change, what to do different, and adjust accordingly. Since then, though, analytics has evolved into developing such systems as ERP or Enterprise Reporting uh, Resource Planning Systems uh, and all on that data warehouse to collect that information and really analyze what, what actually happens in your business from an aggregated perspective. Uh, with that tidbit of history, today's technology is greatly advanced in how we make decisions and how we can actually utilize the actual um, automation, the practice of reviewing reports and so forth to do things like time tracking, uh, perhaps you're looking at compliancy, uh, you're looking at customer satisfaction or service satisfaction, uh, and such things as that is a great insight and basically a thumb on the business or a pulse of the business itself. So here are some of the five key insights you can gain from analytics. So time tracking, uh, most businesses do that quite predominantly. Um, a lot of organizations that do service work, uh, quality control, uh, repair, what have you, they track that service. Um, the ability to actually track it and, and trend it over time, though, is also important. It gives the ability to a client or a customer or even the manager or the regional managers or vice presidents the ability to tweak and refine um, the organization's services level agreement with their clients, customers, or partners. Given that ability to trend things over time, you know, the opportunity to tweak things along the way uh, is, is key to any organizational health. Um, and essentially, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's imperative uh, to run an organization. If you, if you don't track time, 
or if you don't track what you don't measure, then it's kind of hard to get a, a pulse of what the business is doing. Number two, using the right chart to detect. So here's a conglomerate of different various charts uh, that organizations use today. But one of the key things uh, as an analyst and a data, data scientist, when showing data and representing the data, the best chart to represent is something that you have to actually plan ahead of time. Uh, although at the beginning, if you are starting a data warehouse project uh, or you're collecting information for the first time, um, the pie chart might be a great way to represent, but as time incrementally occurs and you get more segmentation or you get more customers or there's more staff that you're trying to track, a pie chart might not be all that ideal. So perhaps you want to move over to a bar graph where you can actually lay out more uh, values and segmentations. Even that comes to be a little bit erroneous in terms of if there's too many data points to track, then everything is one big blur. So maybe switching over to a simple uh, cross tab screen with indicators of green uh, indicating great or red indicating you know something is is negatively wrong in the business uh, uh, in tracking certain items and all that stuff. So having that, um, having the right chart, having the right type of report gives you that intuitive insights to what's happening. Picking the wrong chart, however, it could give you the wrong false negatives or the false positives. And always remember that analytics is not a one-stop shop. So once you have done something, uh, once you've created a report, it doesn't mean you stop there because there may be other insights that you haven't seen. So you know, taking something and cross-correlating it with a different subject just to get that insight into a different perspective is always something that you have to envision. It takes a little bit of creativity too. So one of the biggest things about uh, choosing the right chart too is having the subject matter expertise uh, and detecting or actually analyzing what you want to actually trend is a very important thing as well. Number three, picking the right KPIs. So along with the same uh, picking the right charts and all that stuff, uh, key performance indicators is something that, uh, that's something that you have to look at as well too. It's a fancy terminology in analytics world. It's a number, you see green, you see yellow, you see red, you're trending up or you're trending down and all that stuff. But if you're tracking uh, something that has nothing to do with the business, just for the sake of tracking, um, it's probably not the right idea to take that metric and analyze it. So, you know, take the time, you know, step back, look at the organization and, and, and understand what key performance indicators would actually evolve the business to better suit and to better tweak the underlying uh, business essentials and services. So tracking, for instance, KPIs that talk about utilizing product forms as an example. So if you have a KPI and you know there's about 100 field staff out there submitting forms uh, and roughly they should be submitting you know, two or three or four forms a day, you get a, get a good insight as to whether or not people are adopting to the product, which I'll talk a little bit later about using this as a change management tool. But the good thing about KPIs is once you got the right KPI, you can quickly look at trends and react quickly and make decisions a little bit more imperative when, uh, when adjusting your business uh, needs and, and improvements. When you have time tracking and you have reports, we'll call them objects, you combine that all into a single dashboard. So having that overall view of the business itself, tracking the KPIs, having the re right reports, it's easy just to wake up in the morning, log on to a system um, and look at the dashboard itself and, and get a good idea of what's happening. So along with time tra tracking, along with the compliance reports, you can answer questions like, what is our overall compliance score? Or does it get better or does it get worse year over year? Um, you can answer questions like which region or team has the lowest compliance score, as an example. So with regards to that, there might be something that you wanna talk to that region and things on improvement, perhaps they need a change management um, uh, course uh, or some education on what needs to be tweaked on their side of the fence, if you will. Uh, perhaps they're a little bit low on resources. So maybe there's a resource allocation that has to, to happen there. Uh, you can also answer questions like, how many SLA related tasks do we have to perform this period? So if you're falling behind the times and you're running at the end of the month 
and you know you have to pick up the pace, well, it's time to bring in more troops to one affected area versus the other. So having the ability to combine uh, time tracking, compliance reports, and any other type of reports that you use for your operations in a single view uh, gives you that really good competitive advantage uh, in terms of being able to adjust and be agile and nimble in, in your particular business. And as I said earlier, using technology as a change agent tool, uh, essentially, you know, you have this new technology, you moved from paper over to electronic, you've automated everything, why not use the technology itself to see if people are actually using the technology? A lot of people that deploy such technology don't know essentially whether or not they are using um, the actual technology out in the field appropriately or what have you. And what ends up happening is you bought the tool, you bought 100 licenses, but maybe only 50 users out there are using it, right? So having the analytics gives you that background insights into, you know, tracking users on a day-to-day -day submission that they are submitting, and they're actually, in fact, using that technology to, to submit their information. Part of that, too, is the information that's being collected is important, going back to um, number one through four of, of the insights, Without collecting the full breadth of data, your analytics that you're collecting is really not that great because if the information or the data that's not coming in is not being tracked, then you're not getting a good breadth and depth of what your organization is doing uh, out in the field. With that said, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Corey. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, as you said, my name is Corey Ayers and I'm a Partner Development Manager for ServiceMax. And I'm here just to give you an overview of who ServiceMax is in the digital field service marketplace, as well as a quick demonstration for you to get an idea of not only what we do for a field service platform, but also how we align with Prono Forms. So just to start, I wanted to give you a visual look at how we integrate with Prono Forms and how um, kind of a day in the life would go. So either a customer call or an IoT sensor would give off um, data or a work order that needs to be completed uh, to our ServiceMax uh, field technician. And that technician would be sent out and also a special pur purpose workflow from Prono Forms would be created simultaneously to be completed. From there, um, as the uh, workflow is completed in congruent to the work order, um, if it's a pass, then the sign off from the ops supervisor can be done um, at a different site. As well, if it's a fail, that supervisor will also get an SMS text and notification that something did go wrong. ServiceMax also completes updates, uh, records, fields, and attachments that are being pulled from Prono Forms and attached it to the work order so everything is done in the same place. And those can also be emailed to the customer before the technician even leaves the site. And finally, we do have optional data integrations with multiple different um, places such as Dropbox, Box.com, as well as Gmail. Um, we do have some other optional integrations that can be discussed on a one-to-one -one basis. So in regards to ServiceMax, kind of give you an overview. Um, these are some of our uh, major customers that we've been dealing with. As you can see, not only um, on our manufacturing and life sciences side, but we also have some of our uh, McKinley, some of our mid-market customers for elevators, as well as um, Sony in our B2C market. GE is also a customer of ours, but as you have probably read, uh, back in January, GE Digital did acquire us uh, to be a part of their field service suite, which will include Predix as well as asset performance management from Meridian. Um, so stay tuned for us to declare how that suite is going to be um, completed. So we are currently the leader in field service management. We are 100% cloud-based and native on the Salesforce platform. 
Um, being 100% native on that platform allows no integration and a seamless connection to that CRM system. Although we do um, integrate to all different CRMs as well as ERPs, um, just being on the platform really helps with that integration. We have um, 400 customers in over 40 different countries, almost on every different continent except Antarctica, as well as uh, ecosystems of not only global system integrators, but technology partners such as our great partner, Pronoforms. We do have a marketplace that I 100% uh, suggest you check out, uh, marketplace.servicemax.com, that includes a description as well as a demonstration from all of our different partners um, separated into what they actually do for our system. So I don't know if you've seen, but uh, Gardner has now listed us two years in a row as the leader in the service, uh, the magic quadrant for field service management. Some of our larger competitors, such as Oracle and Click Software, has been nipping at our heels, but um, we are actually at a conference right now, kind of our dream force called Maximize in Las Vegas, with Gartner in attendance as well. And they should be releasing their Gartner report pretty soon, um, in the next couple of months. And we are actually really excited to see it, um, what is upcoming, and we are very hopeful that we'll be even higher up in the uh, leader's quadrant. So in regards to what exactly is field service management and what platform is, this is how Gartner um, defines it and how we're judged out in the marketplace. As you can see, um, some of the basics of technician enablement, work planning and work order debrief, as well as what Danny was talking about, the analytics and integrations are also there. But we're also starting to be judged on the IoT integration, which is the internet of things and um, being able to talk to machines uh, without being next to them in person. We also have the CRM integration customer portal that we're also judged on and making sure that we're leaders in that space as well. When you go down to operations, uh, that's when you come into depot repair as well as the RMAs, SLA contracts, uh, tracking warranty, and um, any planned maintenance that may be done in the future. The good news is we're one of the only products out in the marketplace today that handles everything from end to end, which is why we are currently the leaders. We are starting to see a trend on how we're being judged out in the marketplace and how um, field service is actually being measured. It's not necessarily measured by the assets that are in place um, at a customer's location, but exactly what is the outcome of those assets. Um, just for a couple examples, solar power generated, not necessarily the solar panels themselves, as well as how much flight hours a jet engine produces, not necessarily the specific engine, <clears throat> as well as the documents process with uh, printers. We do have a customer called Fluid Management, and um, they actually create or they produce the uh, paint shakers that are currently in all the Home Depots. If you've ever been in a Home Depot, uh, the one place you can find employees is your, uh, the paint section because it is the largest margin across the board for any Home Depot or really any um, home goods stores out there. So in regards to their paint shakers, they have found out that they can actually increase the cost of a service level agreement if they can guarantee the uptime of those paint shakers. If a paint shaker goes down at a Home Depot, they start to lose money because they're not able to sell the paint that they want to at that margin. We're talking millions and millions of dollars per day. So with our IoT sensors, our connected field service, as well as our entire suite of products, we're able to produce a 95 to 98% uptime for those paint shakers. Now in, in turn from that, Fluid management actually sells less paint shakers but create more revenue from the service side than they ever did from actually selling assets. So that's just one story of what they've been able to do, as well as Home Depot's um, net promoter score went through the roof. Obviously, they're very excited about not having to worry about any of their um, vital equipment going down at inopportune times. We recently sent out a 
um, a report that dictated exactly what our customers are seeing out in the field from before they had service max to after. And these are the response that we got from our customers. Um, it was an independent survey to see exactly uh, where they started to see growth in revenue. And as you can see from a compliance all the way to a growth in revenue perspective, we're starting to see uh, a positives in every area. This will change from industry to industry as well as company to company. However, we are very confident with our business valuation uh, realization tools that we can show you a high return on investment before you even start with the ServiceMax product. And that can be done um, free of charge as you guys get in contact with us. Now to actually find out if ServiceMax is right for your company, and I wanted to be able to put this out there for everyone that's listening, is um, these three basic questions will actually show you, okay, is ServiceMax gonna be the right platform for what I wanna do? And as long as you meet these criteria, we are. And we can start to discuss the complexity of, um, in a deeper dive on a scoping call, exactly what you guys need on a company basis. <clears throat> but when you look at, do you have equipment that meets your needs um, and are maintained and supported by that company? Um, does the equipment need to be maintained over a long life cycle? And simply, are technicians sent physically to repair installed equipment or installed equipment itself? So if you meet really any of those or maybe two out of the three, you're a great candidate for what we do on a field service perspective. So now I'm actually gonna jump into a um, demonstration of our product. It's gonna be a quick, 3,000 foot demonstration to give you just a taste of exactly what we do. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, take questions right after that from me and Danny. So as you can see, if you ever used Salesforce before, this is gonna look very similar. Uh, we are based on the ServiceMax platform, or the Salesforce platform, excuse me. Um, this is in our classic mode, but we also have it in Lightning as well. If you guys have uh, Salesforce Lightning, we have that uh, fully operational at any time. So this is gonna give you a quick snapshot on a manager supervisor point of view. As you can see, as Danny mentioned before, it's gonna show you some basic KPIs or key performance indicators um, that are judged in the field service space, such as first time fix, mean time to repair, response time. We have over 70 different reports already built in within our system. And if you guys would like anything else, um, on a business to business case, we can actually build those for you so that we make sure that anything you need to see, you're able to. And if you ever wanted to dig in a little bit deeper, you can actually pull up the dashboard and find out exactly what's going on for your technicians out in the field uh, based on products, maybe service manager by region or even by technician. We've actually had customers ask us to be able to show how many tech, what technicians are spending the most time by minute on each site. And we're able to track that through our GPS location on their mobile devices, as well as their on-site response time on, during travel. So if you have any questions on this, please let me know at the end of the uh, session. So I'm gonna take you through a quick day of the life on how to create a work order and dispatch that, and then also show you the technician um, out in the field on a tablet that I have in front of me. So usually when a customer calls in and everyone experiences it differently by email, phone, or maybe a contact us form on uh, their website, you're gonna have a variety of different information. Name of the, um, the customer, the contact name, the account name, or even, um, and hopefully, the serial number or product ID name. And that's usually what we um, request our customers um, ask for, because it's so specific, it's gonna give you the right information right away. So if we're looking for a specific um, serial number, that can be found right here. Um, and these are identified by um, individual product ID numbers. So in this case, this product ID is gonna bring up an ultrasound equipment that is created by this, um, this company. 
And as you can see, it's not only going to bring up the product details and where it is, but also warranties, if there are any, as well as any pre uh, preventive maintenance coverages, SLAs, um, the product history. Everything is already on the dispatcher screen or the customer service representative screen. So they're able to um, contact the person or talk to them on the phone and find out all the information that needs to be done. And as you scroll down, there's actually preferred technicians as well as contact information and um, any updates that need to be done. If this had connected field service, you're also going to see any uh, IoT sensors and information based on that on this screen as you pull up the product ID. So to actually create a work order, you're going to see the service button uh, flow wizards at the top. And these will change page by page. But if you just wanted to create a work order, simply just create this big blue button at the top. And it's going to pull all that information from one side to the other and make sure you don't have to re-input it, input it in. Something else it's going to do for that specific product and for a specific case is do what we call an auto entitlement. That's going to allow the system to automatically check if it's under contract or under warranty. This is greatly going to reduce any leakages that you have uh, based on that product. Or doing under warranty, but may not have any of the uh, information in front of them. We're going to make sure they, un they know um, at a 100% that it's either under contract or warranty and what that contract and warranty actually covers. These drop-down menus will also allow you to change it from any site. Uh, these are all configurable and customizable per your uh, specifications during our implementation time. And then as we go down, you can type in any um, information. customer has in addition you can copy and paste in here this is the information that's going right to the technician so they know what's going on once you click save it's going to create that unique work order um, that you can now dispatch out to a technician in the field the good news is um, as we're looking at it right now um, you can see it's work order 8752 and the order status is currently open and we're going to now check out our dispatch console, which is going to allow us to dispatch not only that work order, but also a variety of different other ones. As that's loading up, there's also different rules you can put in place that instead of manually dispatching um, um, a work order that I'm going to show you in just a minute, um, you can also put rules in place that will automatically dispatch them based on region, preferred technician, certifications, um, or really anything you can really think of. And we can put those in place before you guys actually go live. So as we look down, you can see um, up in the this top part window is all the work orders that need to be um, sent out, as well as down here um, is all the technicians we have available. As you can see, we do have a partner section that we do allow uh, third-party technicians if you hire outside of your company to handle some of the different work orders you have in place. We have a partner community um, that you can actually send out work orders. It'll just be that specific work order. They won't have access to your entire suite of customer information. It'll be specific to what you guys want them to accomplish. So as we look down to find the right work order, here we go, Good Samaritan Hospital. All you would need to do is click the work order as well as find technicians. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it's gonna actually find out which technician is closest based on current location. And what we do is we ping their mobile device on GPS and we find out exactly who's the closest at that current moment. This is great for break fix, um, emergency response time. However, we can also show them where they are um, based on location, home office, or maybe their home itself or where they start out for the day. And you can base it around there. Um, 
also, you can actually look at traffic if this is specific to what we want to find, maybe get them over to a preferred client as soon as possible. You can see exactly what the traffic pattern are, patterns are in the current moment and um, send the right technician to get there as soon as possible. So in this case, Scott Techman is actually the closest in proximity. So we're going to go ahead and see if his calendar allows us to um, assign that to him. So it looks like he's open for the day. There's no uh, current work orders attached. You're also going to see non-work uh, order times. Now work order times uh, here as well. So um, as you go ahead and drag and drop this to Scott to be able to go ahead and do this work order, this is gonna prompt you to go ahead and say, hey, the service time is around two hours based on prior activity, as well as um, any drive time that's estimated uh, currently. So it's gonna give him about a half hour to drive there. Once you click save, this is gonna be sent out to um, uh, Scott, either by SMS, email, or even pinging his application on his um, mobile device. So he's going to get a notification. He does have another work order. The blue represents drive time, as well as the work order itself. So kind of transitioning, we're actually going to transition to the field now and see exactly what he's seeing out um, on his mobile device. So this is his calendar view. And as you can see, we see a work order already assigned to him, and we're going to go ahead and pick that one up um, and check to see exactly what he has to do for that work order. And now as you can see, this has a bunch of information on it, and he attached images and videos. He can either attach himself by um, picture or video or maybe attach from the office for him to take a look at, as well as any documents he may be wanting to see. There is a map function over here. If he needs turn by turn directions, all he needs to do is touch that and it'll give him the best directions based on traffic patterns, accidents, or signals. And as you can see down here, it's also gonna give him any descriptions that we've uh, sent out to him in the field. Once he clicks that actions button on the upper right hand corner, he's gonna see a variety of different things. Uh, these are all configurable to what you want your technician to see. But as we go down, he can either accept the work order, reject it for whatever reason, um, request certain parts he doesn't have. He, he's also able to see any technicians in the area that do have a part that he needs to do rather than leaving the site and coming back. He can just have somebody stop by and transfer that part to his truck. And as you go down the list, you can see down here on the safety inspection is Pronoform. In this case, a safety inspection is required, and Prana Forms is going to be the partner that's attached to it, and we're going to use their dynamic mobile forms in this case. So before moving forward, as he arrives on the site, he wants to do a quick inspection. All he does is click that, and it's going to go to the Prana Form site and application automatically. The good news is, as he clicks on site information, and we're actually pulling all the information from ServiceMax to Pronoforms now. And you can actually go ahead and put down the information of where it is and what needs to be done. The next step would actually be evaluating the work area. So this is done very basic uh, level, but any forms from Pronoforms could be done on this as well. But uh, have you walked the area? We'll say he has. He's actually trained for the task or he wouldn't have been assigned for it. And then he uh, has all the required permits. However, um, he doesn't have certain things on this side. This will actually prompt him that the inspection has now failed. Uh, his supervisor will be notified, and he can actually take photos and do a quick diagnostics check. Do a quick show of exactly what's done. So I'm going to take a photo and take a picture of my phone and show exactly where the problem is occurring. So if I say the problem's occurring here, I can actually save that. And then it'll be attached to not only the uh, health and safety form, but also the work order that's gonna be sent back through ServiceMax. And then as you move forward, you can actually add any parts or products inspection that is done, as any, and then a sign off that'll be done as well from the crew. 
And then once you click send, everything is done, and you can go back to what you were doing on the Service Max side. So now that the safety form is done and attached, you can actually see what you're gonna do from a service mask perspective, such as working on the equipment, maybe uh, once you finish all the service, um, the service report will be combined with any parts that you use, and as, as well as um, any labor that was done that needs to be charged to the customer. If it's under contract, this will zero out, um, depending on what that contract entails. As you can see, an auxiliary adapter was used, that was automatically attached by either a scan or finding it through a list. And we actually pulled the um, line part price per unit from your guys' price books as our clients during our implementation phase. And then finally, we have the customer sign off on it, as well as the technician to say the job is completed. And now this will be emailed not only to the client or even uh, printed out if they like a hard copy, but it'll also be attached back to the um, uh, work order at the home office. So kind of getting, uh, that's gonna go ahead and wrap up my demonstration. And I'm gonna go ahead and, apologies. I'm gonna go ahead and give it over to um, the Q&A portion of this. Thank you so much for um, listening. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. This is Anne coming back in. Thanks, Corey, for the presentation and Danny as well. Uh, and, uh, and to our attendees for sending in your questions. Uh, we do have some time for Q&A, so we will jump right in. Uh, first of all, we'll start with a sort of a, a, a basic question about ServiceMax and asking what are the uh, limits on the number of locations or technicians or users uh, that, a, you know, that an organization might, might have when they use ServiceMax? Do you have any stats on that? That's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, so there are no limits for locations that are actually attached. Uh, we do have a variety of different customers that have hundreds of locations, sometimes even thousands globally. Um, in regards to the size of a company in regards to technicians, um, our average deal size ranges around 300 technicians. Um, and we're actually starting to see a uh, influx to 500 to 1,000, which are multi-year, multi-tier technicians. However, um, companies do have between 30,000 and 50,000 technicians, such as GE, um, Schneider Electric, and Fortune 500 companies such as those. We do go down to 50 technicians, but that all depends on the complexity of the use case, and budgetarily doesn't make sense for the client. And we'll be able to tell you that right away on our first call. Thank you. So also uh, another question, can, can we see as the facilities uh, director, executive, can we see the raw data that gets submitted into the system and how and where is it stored? Uh, is that a question for Corey or uh, Danny? I believe that's for Corey. I'm sorry, I didn't okay. come in during the service max portion. I apologize. Yeah. So that raw data is stored on uh, in the cloud on our platform. Uh, we have a dedicated cloud, and we are on the uh, Salesforce platform. So that uh, service cloud is used for the storage of all that data. And you are able to see the raw data as it comes in if you would like to. Those are always um, depending on the company's specifications and what they would like to see, but it definitely is um, to your availability to be able to see that raw data. Great, thank you. Okay, and then jumping over to the uh, Pronto Forms offering, uh, we did have a, I'll pair this question, these questions together. It asks, uh, in generally, how long does Pronto Forms take to get up and running in the organization that wants to use it? Uh, and also, we design our forms in-house. Do you have templates we can compare uh, or that we can use? Yeah, so to answer that question, and I'll, I'll answer the first one first, which is basically how, how fast can it go up. Uh, we have examples of uh, building forms within, uh, within hours um, and customer alike. And it's all based on complexity. Uh, the functionality inside of problem forms is very vast. So in order to improve the business or the functionality of the devices out there, we have certain things and capabilities that allow you um, to answer the same questions over and over again. So 
that's a high complexity type, but in a low complexity, uh, it would take a couple hours to build. So if it's just a simple form with the question is, is my customer happy? Yes, no. I mean, that's not, like even less than an hour to build. Uh, however, on likewise, if you're looking at a very complex one with, you know, you're analyzing a building with multiple floors, uh, it's the same repeat question that you have to kind of answer uh, in a single submission. That's uh, that's t typically a couple of days to a week to build a complex form in that uh, with that nature too. And along with that too, if there's any kind of custom PDFs that uh, you need to send to your clients and they have to have logos and all that stuff, uh, add some additional uh, time to that as well. Um, as to the other question, I forgot what the other question was now. What was the other uh, question? That was, it was about uh, uh, the, per, the attendee designs forms in-house. So do you have templates that they can compare their forms to or that they can use? Uh, I guess, you know, obviously to move, to kind of look at the same type of forms if they did move over to the system. Absolutely, absolutely. So if they have a form that they built and they're looking for something for quality control or service level agreement or something like that, we do have templates that uh, we have in our, our library. Uh, and, it can, and they can take them and tweak them to how they want to use it, or they could just use it straight out of the box and just, you know, rename a few things just to make it their own. Uh, so to answer the question, yes, we do have tons of templates out there that you can to correlate with, if you will. Great, thank you. And uh, what alternatives are available uh, when in the offering that, you, that you've both spoken about, what alternatives are available uh, when the internet is down or if there's not a connection you know, in that building or that area where they are? How does that work? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the product itself is made to be online, but if you're offline, you can actually create the submission forms and what it would do is save it in the draft box. And as soon as you get into a Wi-Fi spot, as soon as that time hits, those drafts will automatically be sent automatically as soon as it detects Wi-Fi connection. So you're not left in the dark, and if you're in a place where there's no Wi-Fi and you have to submit a report, absolutely, you commit to submitting the reports, and it'll save it in the draft location. As soon as you get out of that cave, if you will, if you're stuck in a cave, um, and you hit, hit near Starbucks, uh, using that example, you can hit submit, and along goes your submission. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. What packages are directly compatible with Pronto Forms? Is that question clear? I'm not sure what that. We could always answer that offline. That's not clear. Yeah, that's that's a big uh, big statement to. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, as as an example, Tableau, Smartsheet. Oh, uh, packages. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that we uh, we have is the ability to connect the data warehouse to Tableau. So, for instance, if your company has invested into Tableau, uh, the data warehouse that we have in the background has an ODBC connection. If those people are familiar, you're asking the question understands what an ODBC connection is. There is an ODBC connection to our data warehouse. So anything that we put together in data warehouse can be reinstantiated inside your technology. Um, so that way you're not reinventing the wheel or you're not retraining your people on new BI platform. You're just borrowing our data warehouse that collects the data. Great, thank you, Danny, and thank you for that question. Um, okay, so one more question about the uh, Pronto forms. We'll keep on that track for a moment. Is there a limit to the number of forms that I can submit? Um, sky's the limit. I will uh, respond with that one. Uh, we do have a very large uh, gas electric company from the West Coast that on average they submit about 20,000 submissions to do their inspections uh, and that's run for the most part of three quarters. Uh, so if you think about three quarters multiplied by the days in between and that's 20,000 submissions, I, I can't do the math in my head but that's a lot of submissions. Great, thank you. Uh, and then uh, I think this is directed to Corey, or if either of you want to answer, but it's really about the service max part of the presentation. Uh, Corey, you had showed a, a um, chart from a survey that of your customers and uh, kind of the the improvements or the the benefits they'd seen from the system. So what? How does that tie in? How how were those respondents able to? ascertain those benefits? Is it from reports that are available through ServiceMax or, or how, do, how do they kind of determine, you know, the benefits that they are getting? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so those benefits are shown. We do a um, an update uh, for our customers in regards to an ROI um, realization every couple of years, every year if they do request it. So we're able to show them exactly from when they started to when they ended. Also within our uh, KPIs, you're able to see the difference as well as through um, their own financials, 
um, you're able to see the revenue growth year over year um, by using ServiceMax. Thank you. Okay, and then I believe we have uh, one more question. So uh, before we do close it out, so it's a, more of a, a general question and it's about data analytics. So Danny, maybe I'll pose it to you. Of course, Corey, jump in if you'd like. Um, in terms of data analytics overall, what um, kind of pitfalls or maybe um, pieces of uh, common advice might be needed or might be recognized by facility management executives? What do they run into when they're trying to implement data analytics and go to that next step to improve you know, their operations? Is there any kind of um, common, common pitfalls you've seen or, or even common uh, success, successful steps to take? Um, yeah, from uh, 20 years of uh, building data warehouses and business intelligence reporting platforms for many, uh, many clients, uh, number one, the biggest pitfall is data cleanliness, right? Um, if you have disparate systems and there's no commonality amongst the systems, you know, one department records a customer name one way, another does it another way. Uh, the best practice for creating a data warehouse is to ensure that uh, both systems um, incorporate or use the same way of data entry that all the other systems uh, rely upon. Um, the other way to do that too, if systems are, are kind of stitched in stone uh, and are inflexible in terms of changing things, the other way is to actually clean the inbound data before it approaches the data warehouse. So that way you replace names with more common names that are used against the other system. So that way the architect overall uh, is stitched correct, uh, correctly uh, amongst all the disparate databases. Um, so when you have that stitched together, uh, all the regional information or customer names or social insurance number, if you want to use that uh, uh, stretch of the imagination, are all the same numbers. So when you're counting, uh, adding things, you know, you're, you can be feeling safe that the numbers are correct if the data is coming in clean. So the biggest thing is data, clean data. Uh, the second part of that is, you know, what types of reports are you looking for? You collect a whole bunch of data uh, in a data warehouse platform, uh, but some people will get a little bit uh, too clingy to the data, and it might not be necessary to have that information in the system, right? Um, so you want to be you want to be a little bit careful as to what you want to put in the data warehouse, because sometimes you put things in the data warehouse that has nothing to do with what you're trying to analyze, uh, and that can actually uh, cause some gray areas within the data warehouse itself and reporting for that fact. Thank you. Thanks very much for that insight. We appreciate it. So with that, we will uh, we will close it out. And I want to thank you again, Danny and Corey, for presenting today and to Pronto Forms for sponsoring the webinar. And of course, thank you to our audience for attending. Our recording will be available online at facilityexecutive.com as well as at the Pronto Forms website at prontoforms.com. And if you are in the Chicago area, please don't forget to check out our inaugural Facility Executive Live conference that's taking place on October 3rd in Chicago. You can see more at facilityexecutivelive.com. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great afternoon.